Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about developments in Ukraine. Brendan, there have been a number of uh, discussions about uh, a ceasefire, um, peace talks, particularly uh, those undertaken in Turkey. How do you think um, the prospects of some form of end to this war uh, could be? Uh, I'm afraid I'm rather pessimistic. Uh, I didn't see anything that came from the Turkey meeting um, that gave me any grounds for optimism. Uh, I listened to, to Lavrov's um, statement afterwards, and it seemed to me he was simply repeating the tired old lines about um, denazification. We didn't really invade it, the Ukraine. Um, as long as he is trapped in that intellectual world, I, I really can't see any, any way out. Uh, Macron, uh, who's had some contacts with Putin and Lavrov, uh, was very pessimistic um, last night on, on the French television. Uh, the only possibly optimistic um, outcome that I can see would be if the military situation in, in the Ukraine is so bad and so unfavorable um, that Putin decides it's a war he really can't win. Um, and then he might start looking for a way out. But uh, I don't think he's there yet. On that military situation, uh, there are clearly deliveries being made by uh, NATO uh, of light weaponry to the uh, Ukrainians, including some quite sophisticated anti-tank and anti-aircraft uh, missiles. But there seems to be um, a real stop on, on any significant equipment. I mean, the, the Americans seem to have vetoed the, the Polish idea of, of sending fighter aircraft to the Ukrainian Air Force. And um, beyond that, there seems to be um, no desire to go down the path of a no-fly zone over Ukraine enforced by NATO, which uh, certainly the Ukrainians have been calling for. Well, a, a no-fly zone would very definitely be an act of war. Uh, and I can understand why the Americans and most of NATO um, are against it. It's a little bit like uh, America in 1941, when America was prepared to supply the United Kingdom with a, a lot of support in the way of arms and, and finance, um, but it had decided that at that stage it wouldn't, didn't want to join the war. Uh, and equally, there's a, a red line which has been drawn pretty clearly by the Americans and most uh, of the European Union uh, that, that uh, a no-fly zone is simply going too far. Uh, as far as the weaponry is concerned, uh, I think it may well uh, increase in, in scale as time goes on. Uh, but the underlying decision of um, the Americans and the Europeans is that since Ukraine is not a member of NATO, uh, it, it isn't going to um, trigger um, through the invasion that we've seen um, uh, an all out war. We must hope that um, Putin doesn't imitate Hitler and uh, decide to go to war anyway, as he did in 1941. Um, but all historical parallels are imprecise. Um, that, I was just drawing attention to a part that, of the parallel. That, that, is, that is certainly the case. But uh, the greatest um, pressure is being put on the idea that sanctions is the way to, to get the Russians to change their minds. Uh, but there again, we have a, a, a certain divergence underway, the Americans and, and therefore the British are prepared to have a full-blown um, ban on, on Russian uh, oil exports. And there's talk also of the same for, for gas. Um, whereas the Europeans, particularly the Germans, are much more reluctant to do that and have not at the moment um, shut off their imports of, of, Russian, of Russian gas. Where does this lead us? It's a, an evolving situation. I think the, the Germans have had two concerns, one of which is the economic concern, that they are very much more dependent on energy supplies from, the, the, from Russia than, than many other countries. Uh, but they also, I, I think, um, regard uh, full economic sanctions involving um, gas and, and oil um, as being um, the final step rather than something that they want to take now. They want to have something in hand um, to be able, they hope, um, to encourage um, Putin to come to some sort of settlement. Uh, once you've um, deprived yourself entirely of the economic weapon 
by by playing it, by using it, um, then it might be more difficult, goes the argument, to, to encourage a, a settlement. Uh, but I'm sure that this is a, a position that the Germans and everybody else are, are reviewing almost from day to day. Um, the German attitude now is very different to what it was 10 days ago. Who's to say what it will be in 10 days time? I mean, a lot of this uh, boils down to the position taken by uh, China. I mean, there are uh, people who believe that if the Chinese were prepared to indicate that they weren't going to provide a way around the financial sanctions, and if they were to uh, clamp down on, on the rather limited Russian uh, oil that they currently uh, acquire, uh, that that would bring um, Putin round really quite quickly. But at the moment, the, the Chinese position seems to be one that is standing away from this uh, crisis. How do you feel yeah. about that? Uh, it is at the moment, but but like um, the Germans, like everybody, it will it would be amazing if they weren't keeping that position under review. Uh, and it doesn't have to be an either or decision. Um, they could put more pressure on Putin. They can put less pe pressure on P Putin. Um, I'm sure they'll do um, or take the decision which they think help their, their long term strategic interests. And it might be that, that they conclude um, that um, they don't want to be too firmly attached to Putin. Um, I wouldn't, if I were Mr. Putin, uh, be putting all my eggs in the Chinese basket. The EU um, are considering um, how to react to the Ukrainian request for an accelerated membership of the EU. How realistic is, is it that that could be achieved in, in any meaningful way that could have an impact on this crisis? Well, I think it's very unrealistic. And, and what the, the council said yesterday um, really puts a stopper on it. Um, it's not clear that the Ukrainians would meet the Copenhagen criteria. Um, it's a complicated, long drawn out business to become a member of the European Union. Uh, Ukraine's institutions and, and even boundaries are, are not entirely fixed. Um, and I can understand the reluctance of the European Union to give any sort of undertaking, particularly, particularly when they have rather mixed experiences coming from um, the extension uh, of the European Union to Central and Eastern European countries in terms of corruption, in terms of, of, of the rule of law. Uh, so I think there's a, an irony that um, one of the supposed um, uh, triggers of the war, namely Ukrainian membership of the EU, is, is so distant a prospect. Uh, and yet um, Putin seems to speak as if it's a, an imminent prospect, which has got to be um, warded off at all costs. Another contributing element in the run up to this crisis has been the ambiguity uh, between EU membership and NATO membership. There's talk at the moment of uh, Sweden and Finland contemplating NATO membership. They are obviously both EU member states. Uh, how do you see that? I think it's a very interesting development that um, Finland and Sweden are having this, um, this new discussion. Um, it always struck me as a, an anomaly uh, following on from the Cold War that those two countries didn't join NATO because nobody could conceive of them as being um, neutral in any sort of um, uh, uh, conflict between um, authoritarianism and, and democracy. Um, and I think they will have looked at what happened or what's happening in Ukraine and asked themselves, um, don't we need the, the shield? Don't we need the, the reassurance of being members of NATO uh, and therefore having the, the absolute guarantee that there would be ultimate measures taken to, to, to support us? Um, I think uh, the defence identity of the European Union is gradually taking shape. Um, and I think it will be very important the way in which Germany is now much more willing to take a, a forward posture on this matter, because the, the, the long shadows of the Third Reich until very, very recently uh, affected German defence planning. Uh, I think that people will look back and see that, um, the, that Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, um, was, a, was a watershed in, in German thinking, and therefore European thinking and institutional evolution in the defence field um, uh, in, in 2022. In financial markets, there seems to be a talk of another watershed, which is that the um, 
this crisis may lead to further issuance, perhaps on a very large scale, given the sums of money that could be involved, um, of euro bonds of, of debt uh, guaranteed by the whole of the EU or the whole of the eurozone, um, rather than um, by individual uh, member states. And this would transform uh, the uh, status of the euro as a global reserve currency because it would furnish it with a, um, a, a shared bond market comparable um, in kind, if not in scale, to that of the US Treasury market. Uh, how do you see that? Well, this is the way uh, that the euro was supposed to develop. Uh, quite a lot of the people who set up the euro thought that it would lead um, inevitably and uh, uh, ineluctably to um, precisely the sort of sharing of financial responsibility uh, and financial contributions. Um, it was deliberately the euro um, set up in, in a rather vague and sketchy way as far as its institutional structures were concerned. Uh, what's happening now, it's happening in a rush and it's happening suddenly, perhaps when people didn't expect it, is the development that was foreseen by many of the architects of the euro. And it's not surprising that, um, uh, that major change sometimes comes as a result of war or revolution or high drama, rather than people sitting down and saying, well, we're going to, going to edge forward gradually on this one, to use a favorite foreign office phrase. It doesn't usually work that way. Um, nothing happens for a long time, and then everything happens. And looking back, you can see that it was likely or even inevitable that we would get to where we seem to be getting. Uh, we just got there in a, a different timetable from what was uh, foreseen. It seems this crisis has therefore brought forward um, both the notion of an integrated European defence and of an integrated European um, currency market. Um, very significant developments for the nature of the European Union. Where does this leave the UK um, that has left the European Union? Uh, it's concerning for the United Kingdom. Um, the underlying intellectual analysis of Brexit um, was very much based on the hypothesis that the European Union was a, a rickety, unreliable, um, likely to disappear um, or, or organism, um, that the U European Union um, was a, a, a rotten building which might well collapse when, when the, U the United Kingdom left it. Uh, it's, there's logic in the view of those Brexiters um, who hope that the European Union will simply fail and fall apart. And you know that for the past four or five years, um, we've been told about Irexit and Frexit and Italexit and all the rest of it. And that reflects um, hope and the wishful thinking of, of, the unite, of certain elements in the United Kingdom. Um, but in this, um, um, this um, Ukraine crisis, um, you, the United States obviously has played a significant role. Um, the European Union has played a significant role. Um, the United Kingdom, beyond a, a rhetorical, a few rhetorical flourishes, have played very, very little role. And it hasn't escaped um, continental commentators and um, that the United Kingdom has been following in the footsteps of the European Union, much more than being in a position to lead. Certainly, um, given the expertise of the United Kingdom in diplomatic and military matters, it, it would have been very easy within the European Union to play a genuinely leading role. But I, I don't know if you saw on Question Time the other day, um, former Danish um, prime minister uh, correcting a, a British minister who talked about um, the United Kingdom leading the reaction to um, uh, Russia's invasion of, uh, of, of Ukraine. And she said, well, no, that's not true. Nobody has followed British leadership. Euro European, the European Union does not have the United Kingdom as one of its members anymore. And it's simply fantasy, what you've just said. And an interesting response from the audience, which was to applaud. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to have missed that. One of the areas where um, this um, issue of, of Brexit has, has crossed over with the crisis in Ukraine is, of course, uh, the saliency of immigration. Um, how do you see the impact of uh, the government having been forced, really, to by public opinion, to 
um, it be much more generous towards uh, Ukrainian refugees, impacting on what has been the, the Brexit-based uh, approach to immigration, which was to have a, a notion that Britain should have a global policy rather than a European-focused policy. It seems that um, this has uh, uh, been rather compromised by uh, what is now going on. I, I thought there was logic in, in Priti Patel's uh, original um, uh, refusal to, to make exceptions for, for, for Ukrainians. Um, uh, a harsh and uh, unattractive logic, but uh, if you think the uh, control of your borders uh, is what um, sovereignty is all about, and that's why Brexit was such a, such a good idea, then, then why should Ukrainians, um, even if you, they're Ukrainians in, in difficulty, uh, have any sort of priority? Now, that was an argument which didn't wash with the British public. The British public weren't prepared to accept that. I think the government made it worse for themselves by changing their story every five minutes and um, the incompetence with which they carried out their hard-hearted policy. Um, but I, I, I don't think that necessarily um, British public opinion would see any contradiction between saying, in general, we want to keep foreigners out, and on this particular occasion, because it's um, so sad, because we've seen so many um, devastating pictures coming from the Ukraine, um, we ought to make a, 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 an exception. Um, I, I think that, that there is a, 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 a thought in the British public um, that generosity uh, occasionally um, is justified, um, but that doesn't undermine um, the general view which is not a, a, a universal view by any means, but the general view um, of the people who supported Brexit, um, that um, uh, our borders are too porous, that um, foreigners get in too easily. But of course, we had a uh, immigration policy that was capable um, of controlling our borders um, as members of the EU, which was one of uh, European preference that um, EU citizens were able to move freely, but there was um, every capacity, uh, a capacity that was not adopted by the British government, but was adopted by a lot of other European governments, of um, being significantly less generous to non-Europeans. Do you think the fact that the Ukrainians have received such a sympathy from the British public could now lead to uh, a covert return de facto in um, British immigration policy towards some form of European preference? Uh, as long as we have this government and, and as long as we have the, the, the leading ministers in it who are very ideologically different, driven, uh, I, I find that difficult to believe. I, I, I suspect that for them, uh, the U U Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens um, will remain a, an exception rather than uh, become anything of a rule. I don't think that the discussion of the Ukraine and Ukrainian um, refugees, asylum seekers, um, is, is greatly dominated or greatly affected by the reflection that these are, are, are Europeans. Um, these are, are people from Eastern Europe. Um, uh, as much um, in, in the view of some in this country, um, uh, uh, alien um, to the United Kingdom, um, as were the Poles. Who, whose numbers um, were very much uh, uh, an issue um, in the Brexit debate. Um, obviously, in, in a, a very unattractive, in, in a very re re repulsive way. Um, but I think the structure of the argument um, will not necessarily have been changed for, for many people who are enthusiastic advocates of Brexit by the Ukrainian situation. The economic impact of the uh, crisis in Ukraine um, and of this war um, is clearly going to be very severe for the global economy. Um, and it's going to be very severe for uh, the European economy. Uh, is it going to be um, more or less severe, do you think, for the UK relative to uh, the EU economy? I, I can't see how it can be less severe because um, uh, Brexit is a dynamic, a negatively dynamic process. Um, whereby more and more of the difficulties of having erected trade barriers between ourselves and our, our neighbours and biggest partners um, will, will come into to, to effect. 
Um, I can't see anything that the British government are doing at the moment, um, which um, will uh, mitigate their position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the European Union. Um, and it may well be um, that the uh, elements which you've already described uh, of greater economic and financial integration within the Eurozone will make it easier for the countries of the Eurozone um, to weather the storm um, of inflationary pressures in, in particular. Uh, I'm not uh, optimistic um, about the United Kingdom's ability to uh, do better than the rest of Europe. I think uh, all, the, all the betting must be in the other direction. There's been a very uh, high profile um, sanction uh, imposed on Mr. Abramovich by um, the British government, um, which has masked uh, what is generally regarded as a much slower and um, uh, less forceful uh, approach to sanctioning oligarchs more generally uh, than certainly has been undertaken either by the European Union or the United States. Uh, however, there is um, in this whole uh, sanctions process against Russian money, uh, the possibility that uh, the Russian contribution, which is widely accepted, uh, to Brexit itself might become apparent um, and that that might have a significant political impact at some stage on the, on, on the British public's attitude towards our leaving of the European Union. Do you think that is a, a, a reasonable possibility, a, a, a plausible possibility? Uh, yes, I do indeed. I think it's something that the Conservative Party in particular should be very worried about and anyone um, intimately concerned in the, in the, in the Leave campaign. Um, the argument will be, be rather simple. Um, if Mr. Putin, who now is re revealed as the monster we know him to be, uh, was someone in favour of Brexit and doing what he could to bring it about, uh, then we ask ourselves, is Brexit a good idea for the United Kingdom? Uh, Mr. Putin certainly won't have had British interests in heart, at heart in, in urging progress towards Brexit. Bre Brennan, thank you very much for for this. Um, we'll see what happens over the next week or so. Uh, and until then, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.